Good, good. Great. Thank you. Cool. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Atlanta Council. I'm delighted to see this full house here. I'm Damon Wilson. I'm Executive Vice President of the Atlanta Council, and I want to thank you all for joining us today for the global status of carbon capture and storage, the next wave of carbon capture is our discussion today. Um, greetings to all of you, but also to all of, the, all of you that are watching on the live stream. I want to encourage everyone, including online, to stay engaged in the conversation using the hashtag ACEnergy and hashtag status CCS19. Uh, before we begin, I just want to say thanks to our colleagues at the Global uh, Carbon Capture and Storage Institute uh, for their partnership and collaboration in putting this together. And I couldn't be more delighted to welcome uh, uh, such a prominent champion on these issues, Senator Sheldon White House, who is in the house with us today to kick today's event off. Um, I think as many of you know that as the climate crisis accelerates and global emissions continue to rise, the Atlantic Council itself is rising to the occasion. Last fall, the UN General Assembly, again this January, just a month ago in Abu Dhabi at our Global Energy Forum, uh, our President and CEO, Fred, Com Fred Kemp, announced that the Atlantic Council has adopted as a, a sixth defining challenge of how we operate here at the Council, targeting environment and addressing climate change as one of our key defining challenges. These challenges define our approach. We aren't just a research platform, a think tank. We're a place that provides solutions to the biggest challenges the planet's facing. And this defines our approach to the challenges and opportunities of a dynamic international landscape, and it frames our overall mission of how we operationalize galvanizing constructive U.S. leadership alongside our friends and allies to shape the future together. That's the Atlantic Council mission. So we're so pleased to be with key friends today, including the Institute as well as Senator White House, to discuss the critical role that carbon capture and storage policy must play in meeting this defining challenge. Many of you are familiar with the key studies, including from the United Nations, that tell us with increasing frequency and urgency that carbon capture and storage technologies are likely to play a leading role in helping to achieve the net zero emission transition. In tandem with policy and government support around the world, private sector action has catalyzed the next wave of global carbon capture and storage developments. And particularly in the United States, Innovative incentive mechanisms and sustained government support have been key drivers of new CCS projects. The Atlantic Council Global Energy Center is honored to host uh, a key as a champion, climate champion, uh, here in the United States, of course, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, who will share his views on th these critical issues, as well as the role of Congress in supporting the advancement and deployment of CCS. Following his remarks, the Senator will, will move into a brief Q&A and will open the floor to audience questions. Uh, Senator Whitehouse has served as the Senator for Rhode Island since 2007. He's been a longtime champion uh, on climate and a senior member of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee. In the Senate, he's also a member of the Budget Committee on the Budget, Finance, Judiciary, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficient Caucus, and the Senate Democrat Special Committee on Climate Crisis. In February 2019, Senator Whitehouse led a bipartisan coalition to introduce the Utilizing Significant Emissions with Innovative Technologies, or Use It Act, in the Senate, with the overall goal of supporting technologies that sequester carbon from the atmosphere. He has a strong history in supporting carbon capture and storage legislation and helped prepare passage of major CCS tax incentive bill in 2018. With over 30 years in public service, he came to the Senate after serving as Attorney General in Rhode Island, uh, as, uh, 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 among other positions uh, across the state. Here, he's been a valued partner uh, of the Atlantic Council, including his role as co-chair of the Atlantic Council Task Force on U.S. Nuclear Energy Leadership. So thank you very much for your leadership. We're delighted to have you here. And with that, let me welcome you to the podium. Damon, thank you, and Atlantic Council, thank you. This is one of many issues, including ocean plastic, we're working together on, and it's always wonderful to work with the Atlantic Council. You bring a lot of expertise and determination to a variety of tables, so I'm uh, very, very happy to be here. I'm going to touch uh, four points and then yield to uh, questions and answers. 
Don't be shy, I'm from Rhode Island. We don't just do questions, we also do comments and rude remarks. It's part of our combative, boisterous Rhode Island nature. Uh, point one, the uh, 45Q regulation that is out there that will actually implement our carbon capture bill, which passed essentially unanimously in the Senate two years ago, uh, is still fiddling around in the Treasury Department. Uh, anybody here who has an interest would be well served to give anybody you know in the Treasury Department a swift kick in the rear end. There is no legitimate excuse for this regulation having taken two full years. Still not done. So please join me on that. Um, second, if you like uh, the carbon capture tax extent, uh, incentive, you will probably actually love a real price on carbon. And it's going to take a real price on carbon to offset what the International Monetary Fund describes as a $650 billion per year subsidy to fossil fuel just in the United States alone. Go globally and it runs into the trillions per year. So it's really important that whatever we get done with 45Q and with this regulation be seen as a precursor to proper carbon pricing so that a variety of industries that will help prevent calamity can have the economic motivation and support to propel themselves forward. My third point is that in order to do that, just given the nature of our politics, some corporate support is likely needed. And I just want to make sure that you all are aware from my vantage point in the Senate, looking very closely at this issue, that there is essentially zero corporate support for a price on carbon and essentially zero corporate support for actually any serious climate solution. There are American corporations that have terrific websites. There are American corporations that have terrific sustainability policies. There are even American corporations that do quite well at trying to push their sustainability policies out into their supply chains. But nobody takes any serious interest in getting anything done in Congress. In fact, there are basically three groups. There's the fossil fuel industry, which despite what its CEOs say to get through a cocktail party at Davos, is still 100% dedicated to the obstruction apparatus that it has built and maintains to prevent anything from happening in Congress. There are the trade associations for the general corporate community. The top two of them, the US Chamber and the National Association of Manufacturers, have just been identified by Influence Map as the two worst climate obstructors. So if you're going to them for help, good luck with that. And then there is the rest of the corporate community, the so-called good guys, who all have something more important that they want from Congress than a climate bill. So the net corporate presence in Congress is still against any serious climate action. And that is going to have to change in order for us to get this done. My last point is this. The stakes are very, very high. I'm the son and the grandson and the nephew of United States Foreign Service officers. I grew up in Africa and in Asia in conditions of famine, poverty, war, the horsemen of the apocalypse were present most places that we were posted. And people served in those jobs, in those places, because something particularly mattered about America. And the world knows it. The business about us being a city on a hill is for real. But that doesn't mean that we can't blow it. And if America fails to lead at this climate problem, and if people all around the world, particularly poorer people, suffer because of our failure to lead, and if that failure to lead is explained by us being unwilling to tell a fossil fuel industry that has undue control over Congress enough already, we're going to do this, that's a rotten combination of factors. 
That is not the kind of shine that you expect from a city on a hill. So the stakes are very high. 45Q is the lead, get that done. Then we've got to figure out how to put a proper price on carbon to offset that massive subsidy. Corporate America has got to get seriously engaged. They are not right now. And if we do that, then we can protect our status as the uh, country that Bill Clinton uh, used to say has always profited more from the power of our example than from any example of our power. Thanks very much. So, your questions, your comments, and your rude remarks are all welcome now. And here come microphones. We've got a hand right over here, up, three rows back on the end of the aisle. There you go. Dan Lieberman, of all the uh, presidential candidates, Tom Steyer is the one who's made climate action his main program, yet he's very low in the polls. Does that reflect what the American people really feel about climate change? I think it um, depends a good deal on where you are and what your news sources look like. But certainly, while we're in a Democratic primary, primary voters see uh, health care and climate as the two top issues. That polling shows itself over and over and ag again. And I want to give some other folks credit, because while Tom has been incredibly dedicated to this issue, so has Mayor Bloomberg. So has my colleague Elizabeth Warren, who has gone into fights with me more than anybody else in the Senate uh, on this subject. And so has Senator Sanders, who took a whole day to give a speech on climate and have his Bernie bu filibuster Phil Bernie Buster, whatever it was called, <laughs> on this subject. So there are a couple of people who, for whom this has been a long, long, long time uh, passion and who have demonstrated some real courage in this fight. Hand here. One in, coming from behind you, sir. There you go. Yeah, so. Uh, I talk to a lot of industry people, and main problem is uh, basically the supply chain of how the oil and gas is currently uh, built. And uh, to me, it seems like the issue is we don't have any subsidies or any infrastructure which addresses the supply chain on how to put greener products into the market. And uh, for example, if you look at your oil refineries, uh, they are built and we have invested billions and billions of dollars on those infrastructures. But we have failed to do anything at that level, so the economies of the scales don't make any sense. So the carbon tax credit sounds like a really, really good idea and I think it needs to happen. But at the same point, I think uh, uh, there has to be a different type of a tax, in tax incentive for uh, which would allow um, uh, renewable materials as well as CO2-based capture more useful. So I only hear two or three ideas. What else is in the Congress going on? Well, I think um, you're kind of making my point about carbon pricing, that it's very hard for an economy to develop those alternatives while those alternatives have to bear a $650 billion per year disadvantage compared to fossil fuel alternatives. That just isn't economically right. Uh, it's not right from any point of view of market theory, and it's simply plain old-fashioned uh, unfair. I think if that were corrected, particularly if it had been corrected 10 years ago, we'd be in a very, very different and much better situation right now with the market actually operating the way markets are supposed to. Uh, now we have a second uh, impulse or a second um, factor beginning to move in, and that's these continued warnings from now over 30 central banks, most recently the Green Swan Report by the Bank for International Settlements, uh, groups that are as un-environmental as Freddie Mac, making warnings about coastal property value crash, and all of these central banks making warnings about a crash in the carbon asset world, the carbon asset bubble popping, in which case a lot of this infrastructure that you've described becomes stranded assets. And the warnings about the scope and depth 
uh, and severity of that crash are becoming very, very dire. So there are two things. One, we could do a carbon price and start to move this, but there's also that threat that if we don't get ahead of this and that when that bubble pops, there's going to be enormous economic calamity. Yeah, so to me, it seems like it's an economical problem. So has anybody run numbers on what percentage of GDP will cause us to be serious about it? There are a whole variety of uh, reports that evaluate different carbon prices and how you phase them in and how you accelerate them. And do you start low and build? Do you start high and uh, continue or tail off? And um, I'll let those reports speak for themselves. But there's a fairly significant economic uh, commentary peer-reviewed on that subject with a lot of major groups who have participated uh, in those analyses. They generally come out around where my bill does, because that's why I set it at that, which is a little bit over 50 bucks uh, per ton, accelerating at inflation plus 6% per year with markers to make sure that we're meeting the 1.5 degree target. Yes, sir. Front here. Coming up. Oh. There you go. Uh, Senator, um, I have two, two questions, really. One is, um, what's, the, what's the prospect of reforestation in this country and elsewhere in terms of carbon sequestration? And the second one, piling on to the, what's going to happen to the uh, oil industry, uh, if, as Europe is doing, America turns to the electric car, what hope is there there? Well, in, on reforestation, in theory, um, it works. But in practice, the reviews of the carbon credit efforts that have used reforestation have come back not very uh, happily. And ProPublica has just done a quite thorough takedown of those reforestation carbon credit efforts. So uh, to the extent, um, I think that may be something that can be solved by better standards for what gets credit for um, a carbon credit. But at the moment, that does not seem to have succeeded, although the theoretical principle is, is valid. Um, the second question about electric vehicles, um, there are very bright people who say that electric vehicles are going to displace gas-powered vehicles very quickly, that gas-powered vehicles will actually be something that you have to pay to get rid of because they'll have negative value because it's so much cheaper to run and maintain an electric vehicle which actually performs better. Um, I probably have the worst electric vehicle that will ever be made in any number, which is the Chevrolet Bolt. You put it against the Taycan, and you put it against the e-tron, and you put it against um, some of the other, you know, the Tesla's work. Um, it's not, should we say, the top of the market. And it's one of the coolest cars I've ever driven. <laughs> so when the worst one is really better than almost any gas car I've ever driven. That's a pretty strong sign of where we are. So I think that market is going to shift very, very rapidly, and particularly when it links in with um, automated driving, unmanned driving, um, because at this point, the statistics I hear are that a car is put into regular use only about 6% of the day. So if you can have one ru that runs around and serves a bunch of people, and you can run that number up to having, spending 60% of its time in use, you now have a massive, massive transformation in an industry. So uh, I see a huge transformation coming that for which the uh, economy is not particularly well prepared with respect to EVs, and I think it's all to the good. Yeah. Gentleman with the glasses. Uh, good afternoon, Senator good Mark afternoon. Harper. Uh, it may be up there with designing a cart for a unicorn, but has there been any thought given to what the ultimate beneficiary of this carbon tax might be? And if so, what's the? Uh, is it a driver to perhaps develop that unicorn? Um, it's important. First of all, it's a big driver. If you do my bill, it's 2.3, 2.4 trillion dollars over 10 years. You can get a lot done 
with $2.3, $2.4 trillion. Um, we've been operating with a couple of sort of baseline precepts. One is lower income people should suffer not. And therefore, a good deal of their revenue should go back. And we send it back through an adjustment to the payroll tax, first thousand dollars off, and a similar benefit to people on veterans and Social Security and other such benefits. That leaves uh, some funding that remains, and we send most of it to the states, because each state is also a player in this fight. And we all have needs. Rhode Island has very serious oceanfront needs because of what's going to befall us in the decades ahead. Wyoming has very different needs. West Virginia has very different needs. Arizona has very different needs. And we can help with the politics of this if the states feel that they're going to have resources to address their state-specific needs. And then I'm going to be arguing, uh, I guess the piece hasn't run yet, um, for a very significant um, appreciation to the people who worked in these fossil fuel sectors, that beating them up is not helpful and not politically advantageous to solving the problem, and that they should get their pensions filled back up, they should get their health and welfare funds that they bargained for filled back up. Uh, we could even treat them as like GI Bill, that there is an actual benefit to them and their kids to go to college, and um, that eliminating the prospect of suffering in communities in which fossil fuel was a significant economic driver will help us get to where we need to get to. So those are just some of the ideas. I suspect a lot will depend on where it comes out. Um, if Democrats control, there will probably be a lot more investment in new green things. And if we have to work with Republicans, it's probably going to be a lot more focused on revenue neutrality and so forth. Um, and of course, like we did last time when we had the cap and trade bill, there was the massive feeding frenzy of all the corporate interests coming in to demand their slice of the pie. Of course, sadly, as soon as the pie was no longer there to be sliced, they lost interest in climate change and we lost the decade. Uh, woman here. Given how long it's, take, it's taken the IRS to put out guidance on the 45Q tax credit, do you expect- Treasury. Or IRS and Treasury. Uh, do you expect to pass any kind of extender deadline extension bill this year, given, you know, the need for a begin construction date guidance, and or do you expect that we'll not to see. make it in because I think usually the, the extenders the are the only ones is, that have expired? Is, is um, I think 2024 right now. The so end we've got a little bit of time to work with. Um, I suspect that what's going to happen is that if we're all good about kicking them in the rear end hard enough they'll actually finally get the stupid regulation done that they've spent two years fiddling around with. And when they do that, then the market will react and we'll begin to see from actual case studies that here's somebody who can't make the investment work for them because of the timetable. Uh, but I do think that extending the uh, back end of the program is a very live option. Live as in this year? I couldn't guess as to the timing. Okay. And then I couldn't guess as to the timing. I think we'd want to have a more concrete look at what the circumstances were um, before I could talk timing. Okay. And then can I ask one more thing? Sure. So are you concerned at all that the guidance that the IRS will put out will be so broad that it could be more expensive than intended or expected, just the, so broad in the application to different types of carbon capture? Um, that would be a happy problem to have. I would be delighted to try to backfill to make sure that uh, those resources were there. Um, I have spent a fair amount of time running rivers. And if you're running a river and there's a falls on the river or a, some cataract you have to worry about, the first way you find out about it is because it's on the map. And you know by reading and looking at it where it is. Well, we've been warned where the cataracts and are on our climate falls, and we didn't pay any attention. And then you get closer to the falls, and you can actually hear the river roaring at you as you get closer. And um, we're now into that with farmers and fishermen and people saying, wow, this is really weird. This is not what I've seen before. Um, and then there's the last moment before you pitch into the cataract where you can actually get to shore safely, but you've got to paddle for your life. And I think we're sort of at that moment 
right now with respect to solving the climate problem. So if 45Q expands, I'll take it. Thanks. Sir. This gentleman's going to go first. Hi, nice to see you again. Bill Stetson. Oh, hey, Bill. How are you? How are you? Sorry, I didn't recognize you in the glare. My fancy new glasses. So, uh, Very impressed. I, I was an advisor to uh, General Motors 15 years ago. Yep. And not one of the cars we were working on that were supposed to be low carbon is in existence now. Actually, your car is a pretty good car. It's a very good car. But uh, we tried to establish in Vermont uh, a supercharger system from Quebec to Massachusetts. Never happened. There was just not the political will. Though the car, the car companies were willing to kick in some money. Um, what can the states do to make this happen? Because you read the green car reports, you listen to what you've said today. Yeah. It, it looks like it's about to happen, but it's not happening that quickly. And car and the actual sales force doesn't know much about these units. So, what can we do? Well, I'll, one happy piece of news is that in the Environment Public Works Committee where we usually rage at each other on everything environment. We actually work reasonably well on things public works. And in the latest highway bill, there is a very, very significant investment in electronic vehicle infrastructure uh, to support that along the highways and to support states which get the bulk of that money in this as an allowed use for federal highway funds. So um, if we do, in fact, get to passing that bill, that'll be an important step. And that bill passed the EPW committee unanimously. So it's an interesting thing. As long as you're not rubbing Republican noses in climate change too far, there are productive things that they will support. And in this case, they did. So it was, um, I think the EVs are just going to take off on performance, cost, maintenance, uh, just the quality of the vehicles. Microphone to this gentleman here. Oh, somebody has it already. Fire away. Okay. Um, Haven't had a rude remark yet. What's the matter with this crowd? <clears throat> the grid is pretty vulnerable either to attack or solar flares or whatever. Why isn't more uh, mitigating the vulnerability of the grid, like breaking the big grid up into multiple microgrids, uh, part of this discussion about greenhouse gases? Well, it is part of the discussion in the sense that whenever we talk about either a Green New Deal or a big infrastructure bill, rebuilding the grid is always a part of that conversation. There's a gap between where the ISOs are with respect to here's what we actually need to do and the technical people who do grid management and what we know in Congress about this. So basically, in these hypothetical bills, we dump money into the fix the grid account without a whole lot of detail about exactly how it's going to be spent. Um, and we're never going to be really expert in that. But I do think that when we get around to passing a serious infrastructure bill, it will have a significant grid upgrade uh, component. And it should. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Senator, uh, based on your previous answer about working with the Republicans, we know that energy efficiency, conservation, research and development all lead to reduced greenhouse gas emissions, and you don't have to buy into greenhouse gas emissions because there's consumer benefit in saving money. Any chance you'll be able to get a super majority of Democrats and Republicans to push forward more legislation in those areas? Um, we will have to see. Um, the fossil fuel industry, I think, does a lot to try to damage those things, even though they are uh, acceptable to members. Um, but there is a very significant bill that will have probably better than a dozen component parts being crafted and assembled in the Senate Energy Committee under the leadership of uh, Chairman Murkowski and ranking member Manchin. And when that comes to the floor, I think it can expect to have a suite of amendments that will strengthen it. 
And uh, a good deal of that is in the efficiency space because um, Senator Shaheen in particular has been very active in working on those issues with Senator Murkowski. So I'm hoping that when we're done with the impeachment, that becomes one of the things that we move forward with in a bipartisan way and that gets us moving and energy efficiency is a very big part of that. So I've got the signal that I've got to get back up to the uh, Capitol. Thank you all for being here. This is a, a terrific conversation. Thank you to the Atlantic Council for managing it and uh, on to the Treasury with torches and pitchforks and get 45Q <laughs> thrown loose. Thank you. Senator, thank you for that rousing and frank call to action for that eloquent uh, articulation of what needs to happen going forward. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is David Livingston. I'm the Deputy Director for Climate and Advanced Energy in the Atlantic Council's Global Energy Center. Thanks all of you for being here. Thanks to those of you tuning in via lo the live webcast from home or from work. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce the next part in our program before we move to our distinguished panel. Uh, we're very privileged to be getting a personal presentation of the latest Global CCS Status Report, the 2019 report, which was just released uh, from Jeff Erickson, General Manager for Client Engagement at the Global Carbon Capture and Storage Institute. Jeff, the podium is yours. Uh, thank you, David, and thank you to the Atlantic Council as well for co-hosting this event with the Global CCS Institute. We're so pleased to have Senator Whitehouse kick us off this afternoon. Um, his uh, championing of climate issues and carbon capture in particular has been particularly valuable for all of us in the climate and energy space as well as those of us who focus on carbon capture in particular, and we're grateful for his presence this afternoon. Uh, today I'm pleased to uh, present some of the key data and main messages from our 2019 Global Status of CCS report. This is the Institute's flagship report. It's produced annually, and it's our major contribution to the energy and climate change discussion. It's frequently cited in the media, in technical papers, and at conferences, and we're very pleased that it's so often referenced as an authoritative reference. This year's report was launched in December in Madrid at COP25, and since then the report's been downloaded more than 3,000 times. And I would encourage all of you, if you haven't already downloaded the report, to go to our website, globalccsinstitute.com, and download that for yourself. It's freely available to the public. There are two key messages that permeate the report. Uh, the first is that urgent action is required to achieve our climate change targets. And the second that goes hand in glove with that is that carbon capture and storage is a vital component of achieving those targets. The report recaps some worrisome realities about where we are today. First, although the, goal, uh, the goals that the world's countries have set out, and the consequences of not meeting them are clear. Uh, progress has been slow, emissions continue to grow, and fossil fuels, for better or for worse, are, uh, are, are entrenched in our economy, and we expect that to continue for a long time. Now, the IEA says that upwards of 70% of our primary, primary energy will come from fossil fuels by mid-century. And I'm often challenged um, by, that, uh, uh, by that analysis. And my response is even if the IEA is wrong by half, we'll still be using fossil fuels for somewhere around 40% of our energy needs. And that's too big to ignore. Uh, and so we need to address the emissions that are coming from not just power plants, but industrial facilities and through the use of fossil fuels and do it now uh, and, and do it over the coming decades. Finally, the, the final reality um, that is widely agreed is that overshoot of either the 1.5 degree target or the 2 degree target is very likely and we're going to need to pull back some of that, that CO2 
from the atmosphere through various means. So this chart reflects the gap between rhetoric and reality. Senator Whitehouse was talking about how uh, a lot of uh, companies um, uh, support action on climate change on their website and otherwise, but when it, when it comes to real action, real investment, and real policy change, there is a gap between the rhetoric and the reality. The top line is where we will be by mid-century with the, uh, the stated policies, the policies that are currently in place or proposed. The bottom line then is what's required to keep the world's uh, global warming below one and a half degrees. That's the sustain sustainable development scenario. And you can see that, that carbon capture plays an important, although not overwhelming role in those reductions. It uh, accounts for about 9% of the um, anticipated carbon reductions that are required to close that gap. So what is it about carbon capture that makes it an essential element of the 21st century industrial economy? Well, there are four factors. First, as I mentioned before, carbon capture is vital to the, the achievement of uh, our stated climate change goals. It's versatile, and I'll show you in a minute the numerous uh, types of facilities and industries that carbon capture applies to. It's proven. We've been storing CO2 permanently in the subsurface for more than 40 years now. We've been separating CO2 from air streams, from emission streams for close to a century now. And uh, I continue to get frustrated when I see comments to the contrary. There was an article in the New York Times just today about, uh, or yesterday rather, about uh, uh, coal plants in Japan. And it was stated that um, carbon capture and storage is a technology that is not commercially available. Meanwhile, the two uh, power plant, coal-fired power plants that have carbon capture on them have, between the two of them, captured about 8 million tons uh, since, since, they've, uh, since they've been started. And we continue to see carbon capture being applied not just on power plants but across various industries, uh, and that number is increasing year on year. Finally, carbon capture is an enabler of a new type of economy, one that preserves jobs, one that enables the opportunity to use hydrogen in multiple ways, um, and one that enables a transition to a truly low carbon industrial economy. So what is the status of carbon capture and storage? Well, in a word, momentum is building, uh, certainly not to a sufficient degree, but we see momentum building. There are currently 51 large-scale facilities in construction, operation, or development. 19 currently in operation. Uh, the most recent to come online was Gorgon in Western Australia uh, at an LNG export facility. There are four under construction. Two of them are in Canada, uh, uh, associated with the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line. And we expect those two projects to be online and sequestering CO2 permanently in the next several months. And then there's 28 facilities that are in some stage of development. Now, in addition to those, these are just the large scale projects and by large scale, we define, define large scale as about 800,000 tons per year on power plants and about 400,000 tons per year on industrial facilities. Um, so that is, uh, those numbers are larger than most of the large scale uh, solar projects that you'll see, the largest in the world. Um, are not as are not capturing or, or reducing CO2 by as much as, as those as our threshold for large scale projects. In addition to these numbers, there are hundreds of smaller scale projects. There are hundreds of entrepreneurs in their garages trying to figure out how to reduce CO2, how to capture it from the air. And there are hundreds of ideas about projects trying to figure out how to put the economics and the technical aspects of these together. So there's a lot of activity in carbon capture currently. And one thing that's really heartening to me is to see this activity increasing and people trying to find a better way, a cheaper way, a more effective way to capture CO2 or take it out of the atmosphere. So what does it look like on a global, global basis? Well, there are a couple things that you can see from this map. First of all, the majority of activity, both in current projects that are in, in operation and those that are in development, are existing in North America and primarily in the United States. 
Second, you can see a lot of activity occurring in Europe. And this is a really massive turnaround from just a couple of years ago where uh, we weren't sure what was happening in Europe. There were a couple of governments that had pulled back on some of their commitments to carbon capture. And it's really heartening to see this additional activity that's occurring in Europe. And then a third cluster that you see uh, is in China. And while there's not as much information available to Western audiences as, uh, about what's happening in China, there certainly remains a lot of activity. And there are elements of the government uh, that remain quite committed to carbon capture, quite committed to addressing climate change quite seriously. And we're encouraged by the activity that's in China as well. So here's another view of the current status of carbon capture. And this graph shows uh, how carbon capture applies across various industries. In the red are those projects that are, are uh, in operation to the right and the blue are those that are in development. And uh, what, you, what you see here is if you look down at the bottom, there are actually just two carbon capture projects on coal-fired power plants. But encouragingly, there are uh, several others that are in development, again, primarily in North America. The other thing that you can notice here, even if you can't quite read the print, is that carbon capture applies in various industries, including iron and steel and in cement manufacturing. If nothing else, 2019 was a year of milestones. Uh, Quest, the Shell's carbon capture project in Alberta, surpassed the 4 million tons milestone. Um, Shoot Creek in the United States surpassed 100 million tons of CO2 stored since its inception. I mentioned before the Alberta carbon trunk line construction on the pipeline is complete. They're in the commissioning phase now, and we anticipate startup of injection anytime. Sleipner and Snovit, the two projects in Norway, have been capturing carbon dioxide uh, Sleipner since 1996. Um, and they're doing it safely, and they're doing it with robust accounting. And if anything, uh, those two projects demonstrate that carbon capture is safe and is permanent. And then, as I said, Gorgon in Western Australia has, has begun injecting uh, midway through the year in 2019. Nearly 30 million tons of CO2 was stored in 2019. And cumulatively, since we've been keeping track, um, and this is anthropogenic CO2, this does not include naturally occurring CO2, more than 260 million tons of CO2 has been stored permanently. And there are several projects now that we've added to our database uh, that are in, advanced, in the advanced development stage. Five of them are, are shown here in uh, the United States. Um, uh, there's one significant project in Abu Dhabi as well. This year we added 10 new projects to our, our database, including three others that are in early stage development in North America. So it's no surprise, should be no surprise, that actually the trend is upward. And uh, this graph demonstrates the amount of CO2 um, that, that has, been, uh, 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 has been stored uh, over the last uh, many years. And you can see that the trend is again upwards after a downward trend over the last several years. The status report also con uh, contains these uh, uh, one-page uh, regional collages, if you will. And I'm not going to go through everything that's on, this, uh, on, on these collages, but I'm going to give you a, a snapshot and uh, just highlight one particular um, piece of information that's on each one of these collages. In North America, as Senator Whitehouse mentioned, the big story is 45Q. But coupled with 45Q is a low-carbon fuel standard, which in California is driving an awful lot of interest and in investment in carbon capture and storage. Um, between the two of those, if, if you stack those two, uh, uh, those two policies, uh, those organizations that store CO2 um, can achieve uh, uh, about $250, uh, $240, $250 per ton of CO2 permanently stored. So low, low carbon fuel standard in California um, remains quite a compelling incentive. Um, and again, outside of California, the big story is 45, 45Q. Yes, we're all waiting with bated breath for the IRS to issue its guidance. Um, but we continue to see among the folks that we're talking to uh, that everyone's getting ready for that. And while there haven't been an awful lot of announcements about new projects, um, we expect to see a, a significant push 
uh, and several announcements um, in the in the six to twelve months after the guidance is finalized. In Europe, in Europe, ten new projects are in development, and again, quite a quite a, a, a turnaround from just a couple of years ago. Um, and a lot of these projects have hydrogen as a significant portion, a significant part of their business model. In the Asia Pacific region, the story continues to be about emissions and coal. The Asia Pacific region um, uh, continues to build uh, new coal-fired power plants. They continue to be uh, uh, the largest region for CO2 emissions. And you know, it's often said that it doesn't matter what we do here in the States. If, the, if there's not activity and not reductions in some of the Asian countries, it's not going to matter. And I absolutely agree with that. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't lead. What it does mean is we have the opportunity um, to, lead, to lead by example, if you will, uh, to transfer some of that, that technology and bring some of those other countries along. I will say that some of the poorer countries in Asia, um, the challenge is to find policies um, that will incentivize carbon capture and storage. And just a side note, just uh, uh, recently, the Global CCS Institute was asked by the Chinese government to develop a study or to conduct a study on policies um, that they could initiate that would incentivize their financial sector to invest in carbon capture and storage. So the Chinese government is looking for a way to bring the private sector in China on board to deploy more carbon capture and storage. And finally, in the Middle East, uh, the big story there is Saudi Arabia and the United Arab uh, Emirates. Those two countries are the ones that are, are leading the charge on carbon capture in the Middle East. Um, there is a significant uh, amount of interest in uh, um, reducing carbon emissions from their primary product, uh, oil and gas, uh, to be a part of that low carbon economy that everyone sees coming. And uh, significantly, the uh, Saudi Arabia talks about carbon capture as part of their circular economy. The UAE is uh, uh, ADNOC, the oil company, the national oil company in the UAE, has announced that they want to increase by five times the amount of CO2 that they're capturing. And they've announced a, uh, a, a phase two of their existing carbon capture and project. So what does carbon capture look like, like in the future? Well, the, the report concludes with a bit of a look ahead. And it identifies several characteristics of carbon, uh, of CCS, that we can expect going forward. First, we'll see more carbon capture on natural gas power plants. Um, and um, in many cases, part, in many places, excuse me, uh, the license to operate for natural gas fired power plants will be dependent on capturing their CO2. Second, hydrogen will continue to be a growing part of the conversation, the discussion. Um, around uh, CCS and, and be a, an important part of future carbon capture projects. Um, there are a couple ways to create carbon-free hydrogen. Um, one is through electrolysis using renewable energy. Another is to separate the CO2 from methane and uh, store the CO2. And uh, it's, in my view, going to come down to economics. And if you, if you base uh, the approach on economics, then certainly carbon capture has a significant advantage over electrolysis. So we expect the hydrogen coupled with, with CCS will be an important part of the energy future. Um, third is, is the power sector. And as we've uh, shown, carbon capture has been uh, lagging behind under the other industries in the power sector. We do expect that to change over the next couple of years, and we're seeing momentum in that direction, particularly here in the US. Bioenergy with, with CCS, again, as we look at moving towards net zero by 2050 or carbon negative projects, uh, this will be an important combination of technologies to address uh, climate change. And direct, direct air capture, excuse me, is, is another element, uh, another a type of carbon capture that's going to be increasingly important as we move to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Putting CO2 into useful products beyond enhanced oil recovery is, uh, again, going to be an important element, um, al although subsurface storage um, will continue to manage the bulk of the, of the volume of the CO2 that's going to be captured. 
uh, but utilization will be an increasing and growing element of this as well. Um, and finally, the, the one thing that I think is driving more and more interest in carbon capture from various quarters is this shift in the conversation from just a few years ago when many companies and countries were talking about a 40 or 50 percent reduction in carbon emissions to now more and more companies every day, companies and countries, are talking about net zero by 2050. And we think that's going to continue to drive interest in carbon capture as part of that, uh, as part of that solution. So again, I, I'll encourage you all to uh, go beyond the remarks that I've just made. Go to our website, download, uh, download the status report. It's globalccsinstitute.com. And uh, um, with the rest of you, I'm now looking forward to uh, hearing from our panel. Thank you very much. All right, terrific. Thanks very much, Jeff. Now, if I can ask my panelists to come up to the stage, uh, we've now got a terrific dynamic panel of experts to dive into the report, to dive into some of the themes that have been raised so far in the introduction of this report, and to talk about what we should expect from global carbon capture and storage developments in the year 2020 and indeed in the decade ahead. Um, let me briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, starting here, closest to me, uh, Lee Beck is a senior advisor at the Global CCS Institute, and we're also very proud to say she's also a Women Leaders in Energy Fellow here at the Atlantic Council. For those of you interested in this program, I encourage you to go online. It's an opportunity for rising women leaders in the energy sector to gain professional development, exposure, uh, and opportunities here in, in an Atlantic Council platform, mentoring as well. That's currently open for applications for our next round. And I'm sure Lee would also be happy to tell you a little bit about that um, at our cocktail reception following today, the conclusion of today's event. Um, uh, right next to Lee is Janet Peace, who's Senior Vice President for Policy and Business Strategy at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, uh, C2ES. Um, next to her is Ryan Edwards, Low Carbon Policy Advisor at Oxy Low Carbon Ventures, um, and a former uh, advisor in Senator Whitehouse's office, uh, so a reunion of sorts for him. Um, and right next to Ryan is Maya Batres, Project Manager for Energy and Land Use at the Nature Conservancy, uh, located in California, and we're very grateful to have Maya here today. Um, Lee, I want to kick things right off with you, uh, considering that you're also a, a, a big part of putting this report together um, and in articulating what it means and what, these, uh, uh, you know, what this latest report says about the way that carbon capture and storage is going. Some things I picked up in Jeff's presentation, new players, uh, new business models, um, new partnerships, perhaps. What were some of the ones that stood out for you in this year's report in terms of the developments that we're seeing, what are the new business models, the new partnerships, or the new actors in this space that excite you the most? Thank you so much. Um, I'd also like to thank you, David and Randy, for having us here at the Atlantic Council today, and also particularly Bina Hussein, who I've seen in the audience, who launched the Women Leaders in Energy Fellowship. So thanks so much, everyone, for having us. Um, and it's fantastic to see such a really full room uh, for carbon capture. I don't think we would have imagined this two years ago, so that's, thanks for coming today. Um, so from our perspective at the Institute, we're really excited, and I think it's important to point out that we're launching a report that's called Targeting Climate Change, but we're also at an event that's called the next wave of um, CCS. So targeting climate change is really from a global perspective you know, as we saw with the IPCC 1.5 degree report, we've seen more governments embrace net zero targets. And as such, um, within these net zero targets, we're seeing more governments embrace CCS thinking California, thinking the UK, which really said, you know, if you want to go to net zero, it's no longer an option, it's a necessity. And then from the next wave of CCS is really started here in the US with sustained government support and the policy mechanisms that we are seeing uh, in California, 45Q, um, which are really this next generation of CCS projects, which we think, you know, they're moving, they're not only single sink, single, so single source, single sink, but more hubs and clusters. So we're really taking advantage of shared infrastructure, shared geologic storage. Um, we're also seeing, as you've mentioned, new business models. Um, I think Ryan can talk about this perfectly. We're bringing in first movers on the corporate side are bringing in new actors. We're seeing offtake agreements. We're seeing the application of director capture um, at scale, uh, cement capture, which is really important from a global perspective. 
And I think what's really important to note is that we're seeing smaller companies team up new technologies um, brought in. For example, just recently we're looking at a partnership between Svante and Climeworks from Switzerland, which are looking to cap couple industrial emissions and director capture. So we're seeing all these new kind of exciting developments, which we think is this next generation of carbon capture. Terrific. Um, Janet, uh, the, the C2ES has been a longtime supporter of, uh, of carbon capture. In fact, I think you're a co-founding co member of the Carbon Capture Coalition. Um, why is that? Uh, what, have, what have you seen in carbon capture in terms of its role in the, in the decarbonization portfolio? Um, and what, what excites you about the most recent years uh, in terms of these new coalitions, these new actors? I, I have to uh, just start by thanking the Atlantic Council and the Global Institute for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Um, and carbon capture is pretty exciting. I mean, it, when we started doing this way back when, um, you know, it's like, oh, it's way, out in the, it's way out in the horizon. We'll see if we get there. You know, we had Weyburn, but there really wasn't much else. Um, and since then, you, you know, we've seen Oxy Ventures arise. We've seen lots of different companies um, coming to the table. And you know, as Jeff said, there's all kinds of different activity in different places in the world. It's, it's exciting. It's not where we need to be. I'm not going to say it is, because it isn't. Um, we certainly need more policies. We need more actors. We need more emphasis. Um, I mean, it's exciting, and we're starting. But if you, if you look at how we get to net zero by 2050, all of the models that have looked at this say, you know, either one, I can't get there without carbon capture, or two, it's way more expensive without carbon capture. And if you, if you think about the pathways to get to net zero, this is where the excitement comes in, it, is that we're starting to see CCS being applied to some of the pathways. So you mentioned electricity, but also the industrial sector. You know, cement is getting in the game on carbon capture, and I think that is super exciting. I'll just stop there. Excellent. Um, Maya, I want to go to you next. As a native Californian, um, I, I want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about um, what role carbon capture has, including direct air capture, in meeting some of California's ambitious climate goals, particularly in a somewhat different political environment than we have oftentimes here in Washington, D.C. Yeah, thanks, David, and thanks to Lee, especially for inviting me today. I'm really happy to be here and talk about the really robust policy landscape that California has that's enabling some of the discussions on carbon capture and storage. But before I do that, I want to kind of set the stage for how TNC thinks about carbon capture and storage and negative emissions, and I sort of separate those intentionally. Uh, so TNC is a global conservation organization. We're in uh, 72 countries and 50 states. And we're a huge organization, but we're also very local. So in California alone, we've protected over 1.5 million acres of land. And we're really embedded in communities, trying to understand what the needs are of these communities, how we can build resilient communities that thrive with nature. But importantly to the energy program, which is where I work, is how can we scale up the clean energy infrastructure and negative emissions infrastructure that we need in order to meet our climate and energy goals. So as was mentioned, California has a low carbon fuel standard. In 2018, the CCS protocol was adopted into uh, the LCFS. We also have a 100% zero carbon energy to retail sales policy, in addition to really ambitious climate and climate goals, emissions reductions. And so we are thinking about, to meet all these goals, we're going to need a tremendous build out of a lot of technologies. And carbon capture and storage from the energy side is going to be really important, but so is direct air capture. And so how do we build the infrastructure in a way that doesn't have a significant impact to lands and waters? And we've been leading uh, the charge in providing our science and using environmentally, environmentally constrained supply curves in order to inform the state's planning processes. And I work with a lot of folks up here uh, on trying to figure out the solutions to how we make that happen, because uh, ambitious climate Policies are great, but only when they come with robust implementation plans. And so that's where we are. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Ryan, I know Oxy Low Carbon Ventures has had a very busy 2019 with a, a number of projects, actually. Can you tell us a little bit about what is Oxy Low Carbon Ventures and uh, what have you been up to over the past year or so? Sure. Um, so I'll echo everyone and saying thanks to Lee, thanks to Jeff and the Global CCS Institute and David and the Atlantic Council for having us here. Um, and I'll start by, you know, if not everyone might be familiar with Occidental and Oxy, just a little background. Oxy is a major oil and gas 
and chemicals production company in the United States and globally. Um, and we also have 40 years of experience in carbon capture, utilization and storage. And that's because we're the largest operator of CO2 enhanced oil recovery in the world. And through that today, and for a long time, we've sequestered around 20 million tons of CO2 per year. Um, and so building off of that experience in 2018, given the encouraging policy environment, um, Occidental launched Oxy Low Carbon Ventures as a subsidiary. And we're doing three different things. First of all, we're developing carbon capture utilization and storage projects. We're also investing in and nurturing new CCUS technologies. And thirdly, we're providing services where we are providing sequestration service to other companies to help sequester their CO2. Um, and yeah, 2019 was a huge year. Um, I think the, the event's name is very apt because we really are seeing in the last year the, the start of the wave of projects that are emerging as a result of 45Q and the low carbon fuel standard in California. Um, by my count, there's been about 10 projects announced so far. Lee will know if that's correct or not. Correct me, Lee. Um, but Oxy Low Carbon Ventures has been part of uh, four of those projects. And so just quickly, we have the white, eth white energy ethanol project in the Texas panhandle that will capture CO2 from ethanol um, refining. Then we have the partnership with Carbon Engineering to build the world's first large scale direct air capture project that will capture a million tons, remove a million tons of CO2 from the atmosphere every year. Um, a really cool project is our partnership, and this is our on our CO2 sequestration um, services side with a company called Velocis. So Velocis have a technology and are developing a project in Mississippi where they will convert waste woody biomass into jet fuel and diesel fuels. And we are going to partner with them to take the CO2 that's produced in the process and sequester it. And what's really cool about that project is the net life cycle emissions of producing those fuels is very negative. So using those fuels produced in that plant will in net be removing CO2 from the atmosphere. It's pretty cool. Um, and then finally, just Several weeks ago in January, we announced um, our partnership looking at the feasibility of capturing CO2 from um, a cement plant in Colorado that's owned by Lafarge Wholesome, who are partnering with us, and also partnering with Total, the French oil and gas company, and Cervante, who's a carbon capture technology developer. Um, and so in sum, for me, what's really exciting about these projects that are emerging is this, the diversity that's echoing what Jeff has spoken about and what Janice spoke about, um, the diversity of sectors that they're applying to in industries. So we've got industry with the cement project, we've got transportation fuels with Velocis and White Energy, we've got carbon removal with um, carbon engineering, and amongst other projects that are announced Oxy aren't involved in, we've also got agriculture with a fertilizer production carbon capture project, and there's also coal and natural gas um, carbon capture projects. And so between all those, it's really covering most of the major sectors of emissions in the economy and really showing that carbon capture can be a very flexible tool to reduce emissions right throughout the economy. Again, a lot of those driven by policy, right? And by in, uh, incentives that, that help create a clear, uh, a clear impetus for moving ahead with these projects, knowing that there's value there in capturing that carbon and using it. Is that right? 100%. Janet, looking at the U.S. then, um, there's been some discussion of 45Q, of course, including in the implementation of 45Q in Senator White House's remarks. Um, is 45Q enough? Uh, what are you looking to next? What's kind of the, the next evolution of carbon capture policy here in the United States as you see it? Well, I, I think we absolutely need more because we're talking about deployment, which is so exciting, but we really need, uh, some, somebody told me to call it proliferation. Um, Really, we need it to be going fast and furious simultaneously in all directions. Is it international affairs thing? I'd have to uh, focus through that one a little bit. That's what proliferation <laughs> means to me, too. So I'm like, well, fast and furious, simultaneous, take it as well. But 45Q is a good start. It's not the end. And so uh, part of the, the Carbon Capture Coalition, we put out a blueprint on climate policies that has a whole series and list of targeted programs and ideas that will help move the needle. For example, um, the Use It Act, which will help um, move pipelines in a more expeditious manner. Um, additional funds for DOE's 
fossil R&D program, um, targeted programs that will help push technology out because of incentives, but, but to really get it to go to scale, I'm going to have to agree, and C2ES agrees with um, Senator Whitehouse, that you need a, an economy-wide program as well. So you need something to push and to pull that technology into, into place. You know, we did a study a few years ago with um, Larry Goulder at Stanford looking at, you know, is it more effective to just incentivize or is it more, uh, you know, is it more effective just to, to require? And his results was um, pretty conclusive that it's 10 times cheaper to do both at the same time, to push technology and pull it into use than it is to do either one by itself. So we see a lot of different levers being used today and we think more should be applied. Excellent. And Lee, there's, um also been a lot of developments globally. Uh, I'm really curious about what we heard about the Middle East, about what we're seeing in Norway, in Europe. Um, what's driving some of the global developments? Uh, is it a 45Q-like mechanism? Is it a different policy sort of mechanism entirely? Uh, what's responsible for that, that, that global activity around CCS that we're seeing beyond, beyond US borders? So I think it's really important to point out that 45Q is, from our perspective, the most progressive CCS-specific incentive. And then the low carbon fuel standard, probably one of the most innovative because it um, recognizes that climate change is a global problem. And it actually incentivizes global deployment of director capture um, anywhere in the world because it recognizes that, um, CCS, uh, that climate change is a global problem. However, so in Europe, I think it's a, you know, CCS is one of the seven pillars of the proposed long-term strategy for climate neutrality. Um, we're seeing in Norway, the first two projects were driven by um, a carbon tax, I think was the equivalent of $45. I'm not sure how the exchange rate is. Um, in the UK, there's a lot of government support given um, ambitious, um, ambitious backing of um, carbon capture within the net zero framework. And in fact, um, what I think is very interesting in the UK is that everything is aligning around climate policy. So you have manufacturing policy, transportation policy, and electricity market policy under kind of um, coming together under this umbrella of, um, of climate policy. So yesterday, for example, the um, UK electricity market regulator released a report calling out for how can we regulate the market to get to net zero emissions in the electricity sector. So I think that's a very interesting model. In, in, in the Middle East, I think it's, well, we've seen its um, partnerships and it's obviously government driven. So I think there's, there's not a one fits all approach to carbon capture. In fact, in Australia, we've seen the latest um, large scale CCS project come online, the Gorgon Field, which was driven by Regu emissions regulation and also um, anticipation of emissions regulation. So I think there is are different mechanisms, but what we think is very crucial is that there is a value on carbon reflecting the externalities of pollution. And with you know IMF, I think we heard it earlier saying there's only a $2 average carbon price. I think there's still a long way to go, especially if we're looking at a hundred fold scale up of CCS from today to 2040. Excellent. Um, Lee mentioned California's carbon capture and storage protocol within the, the low carbon fuel standard there. Um, it's really unique in incentivizing direct air capture projects all around the world. Um, California also has uh, a robust debate about international equity concerns as well. Um, how, has, how have you seen that play out, Maya? And, and, and you know, what, what is so unique about LCFS and what enabled it to happen? Um, what is the kind of the unique uh, political cocktail do you see that, that, that's allowed this, uh, this pioneering policy to move forward? Yeah, so I'm probably not the first person from California to come up and say that California is unique uh, and we think of our th ourselves as an innovator for technologies and policies that can be tested out in other places around the world. So the LCFS is certainly something that's driving innovation on the CCS front and a huge incentive for companies to come to California. I think SB100, our 100% uh, zero carbon energy goal is also very interesting. Zero carbon energy is not currently defined by the legislature and so we're trying to figure out whether carbon capture and storage will fit into that. I think that's something to keep on everyone's radar. In terms of your question on global energy, so one of the things I think about, my family's from a developing country, you know, having access to low cost, zero carbon energy is gonna be really important around the world. And so when I think about what sources of energy are gonna be important to build up here and low, lower costs, 
in the global north for the global south, CCS is certainly one of the ones that's top of mind for me. Excellent. Um, and then, Ryan, I also want to touch on you really quickly, but, 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 and, and, and something on infrastructure that I know you're going to know quite a bit about. But as I get you prepped for that, I also want to warn the audience. Um, I see a lot of friendly faces. I, saw, I see a lot of experts here, um, a lot of collective wisdom here in the audience. We're going to get you involved early on. So start thinking about if you have questions. Uh, and as soon as we're done with the question to Ryan, I'm going to come out to the audience and we're going to start collecting some questions as well. Um, but Ryan, you, um, have done quite a bit of thinking about the role of infrastructure, about the role of CCS and CO2 transport hubs and spokes, and thinking about this in a holistic systems way. If I'm not mistaken, your entire PhD dissertation was on this. Uh, so so t tell us a little bit about um, the particular vision that you outlined uh, in that research and where you see uh, US policy could help to realize it and help take it forward. Sure. I don't know if it'll be quick <laughs> because it is my favorite topic. Um, but absolutely, I mean, before I get into it, I think it's really useful and important to really understand why it's so important. It's easy to throw out the words like infrastructure is important, but it's important to walk through and really see why it is really, really critical. Um, and I also note that that's, that's one of the themes in this year's Global CCS Institute report, that this is being recognized all around the world. And especially in Europe, we're seeing a lot of push to help develop these shared systems. And so firstly, like, what are we talking about with sh carbon capture hubs or clusters or shared infrastructure? Basically, it's a system where you have multiple different industries and sources capturing CO2, all feeding into one shared transport infrastructure that then takes it to um, places where CO2 can be pulled from all those projects and sequestered in sequestration projects, there could be utilization projects, there could be a number of different offtakes along the way on that system. Um, that's quite different than most carbon capture projects that have happened to date have been just one source with one sink. So one carbon capture uh, facility and they've usually been built where they are already near good storage and that's the way it's happened. Um, but looking forward to really scale up carbon capture, this shared infrastructure is going to shared infrastructure is going to be really critical. Um, and so what is that infrastructure? Um, by far the most efficient way to move CO2 at large scale is by pipeline. And the US has, uh, in some parts of the country, an existing CO2 pipeline network that's operated safely for 40 years now. Um, but there's, so that's the main way and what we'll probably see most of, but shipping is also an option. Uh, in Norway, they're developing a shared transport system that we based on shipping from sources around the North Sea. Um, so into what the benefits are of infrastructure. So there's three really big benefits. First of all, the obvious one, that you can get more CO2 from more locations if you have a transport network to bring CO2 to where it can be stored. Um, because places where you can store CO2 or utilize CO2 are relatively geographically constrained to where the sources are. Um, you need that. and the next two points are all about lowering cost in the system. And so the first is that all components of the carbon capture system have a big economy of scale. The more CO2 you get into a shared pipeline, the more CO2 you're spreading the cost over, the lower cost per unit of CO2 in the system. Um, the same for CO2 storages. The more CO2 you store at one site, dramatically lower cost per tonne of CO2 you put into the site. And of course, the lower cost through the whole system, the more projects will be economically feasible, the more you get deployed, and the positive feedback effect you get of learning and doing, etc. Um, and another one that's not as often talked about, but it's really critical, is connectivity in the system. So in this model we've had so far, where mostly it's one source and one sink, um, they're completely interdependent on each other. If the source goes bankrupt, has a technical problem, uh, the sink can't make any money anymore, and vice versa. Once you have a shared interconnected system, any one project has a lot lower risk because it has multiple buyers and sellers. Um, and that means that every project has a lower risk. That means they have a lower financing cost. Again, lowers the cost of carbon capture. So there's these multiple ways that infrastructure is really critical to getting the whole system cost down, which is what really matters. Um, but at the same time, as there's all, all these good things, there's some really critical, difficult barriers to actually deploying it. Um, the first of those is just cost. Right now, the 45Q tax credit and the main um, value into the system on the table in the United States is enough to capture CO2 from many types of sources, 
but there's not enough value in that system also to build significant amounts of infrastructure. The second of all, second problem, which is a very common problem amongst many new industries and infrastructure systems, is the chicken and egg problem. There might be a bunch of um, economic projects, say in the Midwest, that could go ahead. Um, there could be a bunch of CO2 storage sites over in the Illinois Basin that could go ahead. But until they know for certain there's going to be a pipeline, you can't progress development and you definitely can't get finance for any of those projects. Same for the pipeline. The pipeline can't progress and can't get financed until it knows all the projects are going to use it go on. So this chicken and egg is a huge coordination issue, especially when we're thinking about really big scales um, that's hard to overcome. And also there's a first mover disadvantage in that anyone who can squeak the economics out and get a, a significant pipeline built, that one or two projects has to bear the whole cost. So there's really a disadvantage to not being the second one or the third or the fourth in. Um, but the good news is that this, these characteristics have been shared, these challenges, by many different types of infrastructure that have been rolled out in the past. So there's a lot of good examples of the types of policies that did get those systems built. And I'm sure we'll move down that path in the future, and I hope so, with carbon capture. And on that note, um, a few months ago, the first bill was introduced in Congress that would help finance CO2 um, pipeline infrastructure by Congresswoman Bustos. So we are starting to get that conversation happening. Terrific. No, thank you. That was an extremely uh, eloquent articulation of exactly what we're talking about and why, there, why there's, it's important to have this platform and someone to, um, to catalyze it being built and invest in it. Um, let's go out to the audience. I'm going to take a, a handful of questions at a time. Uh, go ahead and raise your hands if you'd like the mic to come to you. Um, and as we do that, just a brief reminder uh, that uh, any good, in any good question, the first sentence, uh, succinct, respectful, ends in a question mark. The second sentence does not exist. Uh, we're going to start at the very back of the room, and then we'll come right back up here and then over there. So ending in a question mark, uh, Ryan, please give some examples of, I guess this doesn't end in a question mark. What are some examples of other uh, massive complex infrastructure projects that you think are useful for building the kind of CO2 pipeline you're talking about? Um, and then we had one right over here, and then we'll come back around to this side. Uh, right here in the second row that we have? Or was it in the third row and back? Yeah, right there on the end. Perfect. Yeah, we've talked of carbon capture, but we haven't talked about removing carbon from the atmosphere. And I'm just wondering which is more important. And the reason why I say that is I looked up some statistics, and there are 36 billion tons of CO2 emitted each year, but carbon capture, the, what we're trying to obtain is only 300 million tons, which is 1% of what is given to the atmosphere every year. So I'm just wondering what is the significance of carbon capture compared to carbon removal? And just one other thing, I looked up some statistics and curves over the year, uh, global warming, the Earth warms up as quickly as the carbon dioxide enters the atmosphere, but as carbon dioxide decreases in the atmosphere, there's been cycles. The Earth cools much faster. So it seems that getting the carbon out of the atmosphere is much more important than stopping it from going to the atmosphere. And we've got a question right here in front as well. <coughs> now, I'm wondering about the economics of these facilities, who's paying for them, and, and can you do a comparison in terms of effectiveness with Mother Nature's trees? Great. So we've got comparing natural climate solutions and, and more technological carbon capture. A question on precedence, uh, uh, Ryan, for, for, for what you're laying out. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, a question that we just took over here as well. Who wants to go first? I don't want to monopolize time, but just while I was already talking about infrastructure, I might give the example. Please. Right. And also, to, to your point, sir, um, our carbon engineering direct air capture project is carbon removal. So we're working on that at the same time and uh, hoping to scale that as quickly as we can. Um, but the example is a great question. Um, so I think the most relevant near-term example was the case of wind energy in Texas. So in the mid-2000s, the wind production tax credit made uh, wind projects economic in Texas, that exactly analogous to 45Q. Um, but in Texas, all of the wind is in the west of the state, and the electricity demand of the population is in the east, and there was no transmission lines to bring it between. And there was a chicken and egg problem, and so projects were not moving forward. And so what it took was the Texas state government 
stepped in and legislated and they mandated that those transmission lines be built. They planned where they would go and they guaranteed the financing of them to get over that chicken and egg problem. And it was spectacularly successful in that Texas had a huge wind boom. They got built and um, is the number one wind producing country, uh, state in the country by far. On that, so the Nature Conservancy's California chapter last year released a report that looked at what is the acreage that it's going to take for California to meet its 100% zero carbon emission or zero carbon energy goals. We found that anywhere from 1.6 to 3.3 million acres will be needed to give you some comparison of wind and solar alone. To give you some comparison, California has 90,000 acres of solar on the ground right now. So we are talking about unprecedented land changes for any infrastructure. Um, I think we just really don't and we're, we try to communicate this often, we don't know the land use change that's going to come and we need to start planning for it now so that we don't have a piecemeal approach to infrastructure and we really are doing what Ryan's saying, which is coordinated, making sure that we're being strategic about where the infrastructure goes. And then to your point about carbon removal, which is more important, negative emissions or uh, things like CCS, both are very important. We're going to need firm power to provide, uh, you know, on really hot, really cold days. And we're also going to need to remove as much carbon from the atmosphere as possible, both through direct air capture, but also through natural climate solutions. Obviously, TNC is very invested in natural climate solutions. We've shown that they can account for up to a third of the emissions pie that we're going to need to take out. I'd like to jump into the, the question about direct air capture and CCS. And completely agree with Maya that, that you need both. And direct air capture, you still need to do something with the carbon after you capture it. So there's, you know, you can put it in the ground, you can make things out of it. Um, and we're getting better and more um, experienced with utilization. And I think part of that is um, we have more carbon because we're, we're, um, we've got these different projects on the ground. But if you think about um, just the importance, I'll just give you a couple statistics. And I think, you know, Jeff said that 9% of the gap in 2050 is carbon capture. That's that's nine percent. Thirty-eight percent of the gap for chemicals is carbon capture by 2050, and 15 percent for cement and for um, iron and steel are necessary. That's what the the technology scenarios say. So we we need it for the industrial sector even more than we need it just for the gap, just in terms of percentage. And we have to figure out what we're going to do with this carbon capture. And so as um, as was mentioned, sticking it underground. Right now is the biggest area we have, but we have, um, there are lots of opportunities and I think those opportunities are only gonna get bigger over time for utilization. Um, there's a company called Solidia, for example, that's putting CO2 right into cement and concrete and storing it in there and, and the cement is actually then able to absorb more, more um, CO2 from the atmosphere. So there are some really cool new utilization um, technologies out there because we have to figure out what we're gonna do with this carbon that we capture. Just to add, I think it's really important to realize that um, we know we have to reduce emissions as soon as possible to kind of prevent a worst case climate scenario. And that means building no new unabated infrastructure. But that also means scaling up all solutions that we have. So afforestation is was one example. Everyone loves renewables. Renewable are awesome. Renewables are awesome. Energy efficiency is great. But then, you know, carbon capture is a piece of that kind of climate um, approach. And then direct air capture, I think, or, or carbon removal, it, it, it can be a silver bullet that we rely on, but it's extremely important that we scale up this solution today because we already know we need to um, kind of suck or draw down historical emissions that we've been um, emitting for so long. So I think it, it's the way forward is very clear that we need to focus on climate and have an all of the above approach. Thank you. Um, a, a question for any or all of you. For many years, it seems like um, CCS was really focused on coal. Uh, when people thought about CCS, they thought about coal plants, the coal challenge, etc. It seems like much of the excitement nowadays is driven by some combination of CCS for natural gas, CCS for the industrial sector, um, or direct air capture. If you're a policymaker, if you're writing, a, let's say, a federal energy R&D plan, does that shift, does that diversification, that great expansion in the scope with which you're th we're thinking about CCS solutions, does it change the way that we should be thinking about designing policy or designing R&D? Um, you know, some of, our, some of our, our research and development programs for the next generation of carbon capture, or the next generation of amines or whatever it might be. 
I'll just jump in to begin with. I mean, it doesn't change the fact that we need to get the cost down for any of these applications. Um, whether you're talking about it for gas or whether you're talking about it for direct air capture, moving the cost down with incentives that help push that technology forward, learning by doing, putting more money into R, D, and D, helping actually, um, I mean, the National Academy of Science came out with a number that said, hey, we got to put a lot of money into R, D, and D for carbon capture use and storage, and we're nowhere near that level. So I, I think that doesn't change the bottom line, where we're putting it, um, we're still going to need to reduce the cost. Um, you know, and I also think that it doesn't change the fact that we need an economy-wide program that will be um, helpful in pulling that technology into use. I, I also think it doesn't change, change the fact that um, the you know, significant pressure from the public pushing on um, climate activism, if you will, I think that, that helps all boats rise in this area. Excellent. Thank you. Ryan. Yeah, I'll just add on. Um, I think it's a great question and absolutely yes. And I think we're seeing it in some of the appropriations in the last, last couple of years and also in a lot of the carbon capture R&D legislation currently in Congress. There is this big move to, to broaden, to start looking at industry utilization and uh, carbon removal. Um, but all that work that you, you're right that when we first looked at the problem, we were f looking at carbon capture on coal. But in the meantime, two big things happen, renewables, advanced in leaps and bounds and natural gas in America came on. Um, so we kind of started worrying less about coal. Um, but I think that two points, that those investments in coal carbon capture in the past are still very, very helpful because capturing CO2 out of any gas stream has a lot of things in common, um, even if it's a slightly different source. And secondly, that while the importance of coal carbon capture in America meeting climate targets might have reduced a bit, if you look over at Asia and at the huge size of the new, very young coal fleet there, you know, probably one of the most impactful things we could do here is bring down the cost of coal capture, export it to, to Asia to deal with that problem, because that's going to be a big problem. Because those plants are not only new, right, they're also more efficient, which means they're going to be a little bit harder for renewables or gas or other sources to, to bump out, to bump out of the energy mix than has been the case with older coal plants in, let's say, the US or Europe, right? Yep. Excellent. Um, let's take a few more questions from the audience. Uh, looks like we've got a couple hands at the back, so uh, we'll take a tour of the back. But while, while someone is grabbing those questions, there's a gentleman right here by the microphone uh, that we'll go to for the first question. Um, I have a question about um, California's low carbon fuel standards since it came up a couple of times during the discussion. I just want to know what the prospects are for replicating California's low carbon fuel standard in other jurisdictions. Um, I've been very impressed by both the low carbon fuel standard and the CCS protocol. And I work mostly with foundations, and the foundation community has a real interest in replicability and scalability. And so I'm just curious as to what you all see as the prospects for replicating the um, low carbon fuel standard in other jurisdictions. Excellent question. Um, and then uh, the microphone somewhere. That was my exact same question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Terrific. We appreciate your honesty and brevity. And a question here at the back. If you so. assume no direct policy support for the infrastructure you were talking about, how high of a carbon price would you need for the market to build that out? Great. And then let's just take uh, one other question um, right there, uh, gentlemen, right in back. Uh, perfect. Sorry. Uh, just listening to uh, Senator Whitehouse's remarks and seeing some of the projects that are moving forward, uh, I, I can't help but be struck by the dichotomy of having the oil and gas sectors, historical contributions to climate recognized, but also, you know, the fact that most of the projects are developed by Oxy and a lot of great actors in this space. So I'm wondering if one of you or multiple of you could address, you know, what the role of oil and gas is in sort of changing the idea that they're solely a contributor to the climate uh, issue and, and more of a uh, solution provider. So we had three terrific questions. Um, who, wants to, who wants to take one first? the LCFS and I, I'll do my best to uh, to answer that question though I have to say I have enough on my plate with what I, what's going on in California to think about other states um, you know I think one of the interesting things about the CCS protocol is that it passed unanimously 
Uh, there was no opposition to it when it, it passed in 2018. And so in terms of rec replicability, that's a very interesting thing to us is how can we scale this up in other states? I know of a couple other states in the Pacific Northwest who are thinking about this, um, but I'm not involved in, in their legislative action. So maybe, I don't know, Janet, you're, you've got a broad view. Well, I'll just say I think that the states have um, and are taking an active role in climate policy. Um, I mean, you can look at the number of states that have carbon pricing. We've got um, 10 states in Reggie, two more states that are talking about joining. We've got a price in California. We also are talking about um, clean energy standards. There's 29 states in the District of Columbia that have electric utilities deliver a portion of the electricity meeting a certain performance standard with renewable or alternative energy. Um, there's something called the U.S. Climate Alliance that's um, 25 governors who've signed on to the Paris targets. And those 25 governors are not just coastal governors, they're governors um, Nevada, um, Minnesota. Uh, it, these are not just on the coast. And these governors have all said, we are going to deal effectively with climate change. And it's not really clear exactly what they're going to do, but they are talking about it. And the more they talk, the more they kind of explore around what has worked elsewhere. So I can't say for sure that an LCFS would come up. I mean, it has certainly been discussed um, in many different jurisdictions, but I'm not seeing one at this particular moment in time, but I wouldn't put it past, um, I wouldn't rule it off the table. Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, we released a report right um, in the beginning of 2019 on the LCFS, and what we are seeing is that the interest in what California has done, because it's so innovative, is um, from a global perspective, really interesting. So the Japanese were very interesting and are really trying to understand. Um, I think there's possibly replicability in Europe because if we're thinking about the rigidity of the transportation sector emissions, none of the 10 largest economies have reduced their their transportation emissions since 2019, not even uh, since 1990, not even those that um, you know have made fantastic gains in 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 electricity and industry. So I think. This, this will be a very important signal and a very important blueprint for other jurisdictions globally to follow um, because and, you know, this is exactly the role that California has fallen into so often with energy efficiency standards, for example. So I think this will be really interesting to see who and how it will be replicated, and hopefully so. And, and I just add one last piece. You know, transportation is the biggest source of emissions in the U.S. today. Um, and one interesting thing that's going on right now in the Northeast states is called the Transportation Climate um, Initiative. Mm -hmm. It's um, northern Northeast states that are talking about developing a cap and trade for transportation. Excellent, excellent. Ryan. Yeah, I'll jump in, there's two really great questions. That the how high would the carbon price need to be for these infrastructure systems to, um, sorry, my no, 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 <laughs> um, to spontaneously happen for, for the private market to take care of it? Um, couldn't give you a specific number, but it would have to be a lot higher than what's on the table today, basically because you know the risk in taking on that as one company is huge. And so the prize on offer would have to be pretty huge too. Um, and I think it's not, it's not only the price, it's what's the political stability in that price because you don't want to go build a $5 billion transport CO2 system and have the carbon price go away like it did in Australia. Um, Durability is an underappreciated characteristic because it's, it's not necessarily the price today that drives investment behavior, it's the, dr the price in the future. And it, you ac the expected value really drives you know, where you put your money. And if you've got a 20 year investment, you want to know what's going to happen 20 years out, you're going to make a bet. So durability is really important for policy, it's important for competitiveness, and it's really important for innovation and investment. When, when we look at projects, that's really important. Um, I'd say, yeah, and so the alternative to kind of just jacking up the carbon price, um, the kind of the policy ideas that are on the table in the Bustos bill for infrastructure is to have the government help finance the pipeline and the, the needed carbon price and the overall cost is likely to be much lower under that path. Um, I can take the role of oil and gas one if... I'm just going to add something <laughs> on the infrastructure. I think it's really important to think of this infrastructure as enabler and investment multiplier. So you're not um, just enabling more capture, but also the job creation. And I think a great example 
is um, the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line, which is a 240 kilometer pipeline in Canada, which started out with just two sources of CO2, 1.5 million tons of CO2 per annum, but is built for 15 million tons of CO2 per year and was built with funds from the Canadian government and the province of Alberta. And what we're seeing is, so you have, you have this initial infrastructure, piece of infrastructure, you're allowing each company to kind of um, focus on their core expertise, but you also have this, this infrastructure which signals there is long-term con commitment to this technology and to the success of the deployment of carbon capture. And I think this is really um, important to understand that there is this investment multiplier if the government invests. And so um, moving forward, there are different models of how you could make this infrastructure happen. Absolutely. I see the director of our Global Energy Center here who wants to jump in on something that was just said. On the carbon price question, and, um, and maybe I just misunderstand entirely how 45Q works, but doesn't that effectively put the price on carbon that you need uh, to uh, make these projects bankable? It gives a value on carbon stored in the ground. Um, and as I said, there's many capture sources and there are many projects moving ahead. So yes, absolutely. Um, in the infrastructure side, I'm talking about how do we also get that, that backbone infrastructure built? And that's where it doesn't have enough to also get that built at the same time, gotcha. as also funding the capture projects that are on it. And there's also the issue that the commenced construction date is 2024, and it takes a few years to get these things on the ground. Mm -hmm. So you need some certainty about it. It's going to go forward, too. Great. We've got another question just uh, right there I want to go to really quickly. I noticed the <coughs> discussion on uh, durability infrastructure and big money. I want to ask Ryan and maybe Janet this question. If you were, because of the fact that the capture part is the most expensive part of the system versus the transport and the storage, if you were to invest more in terms of the direct air capture, and located at the site of the storage, you do away with the infrastructure requirements for transport, would you not? And you also, by the fact that you can do these in mass production, you don't have to necessarily put billions of dollars of infrastructure and investments up front. I would like to understand your thinking about that versus the competing infrastructure issue. Maya, do you want to take that first and then Ryan? Yeah, well, so the interesting thing about direct air capture is that it requires a lot of energy and heat, and energy requires a lot of land. And so the sort or the sink is not necessarily the best place to put a, if what I'm saying is direct air capture does not necessarily go next to a sink because of the land use requirements associated with it and the heat requirements. And maybe Ryan can talk about this a bit more, but it's strategic sometimes to put direct air capture plants in places that, for example, geothermal energy would be a good place to put it because of the heat that it can provide and limited land use. Um, but direct air capture, what I've seen, requires anywhere from 250 megawatts to 500 megawatts per million, ton, million metric tons of carbon removed. So that's pretty significant in land use, and that's one of the barriers to putting direct air capture right next to a storage site. You might want to talk to Arizona State. I'd pick on, on what Maya said, that direct air capture deployment is not as flexible as it might seem at first thought. Um, and, you know, that's a, it's, it's very logical to think, oh, we were taking the CO2 out of the air, we can put it anywhere, anywhere, but I'm sorry to have to tell you, it's actually quite wrong too. Um, and the reason is, and you said that this is what we've always understood, captures the most expensive part of the system, transport and storage are cheap. That's only true at large scale. If you look, at, if you look into the reports where all those numbers come from, they're always assuming a f at scale system. But to build a pipeline that's only transporting maybe a half a million tons of CO2 a year and to try and put it in a CO2 storage that's only putting c half a million tons of CO2 in the ground a year would be, those costs would be way higher than the capture cost um, because there's this huge economy of scale. For, for a saline storage project, you have to do almost the same characterization, um, permitting and everything for a half million ton a year site as you do for a 10 million ton a year site. So it's much more expensive to do it for a little amount. And especially as we start deploying direct air capture, it's going to be at relatively lower scale. They're going to be pretty small projects. And so the cost to store that CO2, if it's standalone, will be very, very high. So the benefit to direct air capture of having a shared system that it can just inject CO2 in is actually huge. By developing that system, you would also dramatically increase the number of places you could build direct air capture. That was a great question and very logical, but 
Yeah. We can have a chat after. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to touch on, uh, we talked about the importance of a carbon price, but the reality today is that if you look at the global blended average carbon price, it comes out to about $2 or less per ton of CO2. Okay. Yeah. Nowhere near what we're talking about here. On the other hand, there's a lot of celebration of what we're seeing in the private sector, right? Just in the past month or so, big announcement on sustainable finance from Goldman Sachs, big announcement on sustainable finance from BlackRock. Um, that's on the, f the financier side of the, the table. On the corporate side, with corporate climate reduction goals, you've got companies like Stripe or like Microsoft that have explicitly targeted some role for negative emissions uh, and some form of carbon capture in their own corporate climate plans. Do those sorts of movements in the private sector matter for a technology like CCUS, or do they only matter insofar as they're potentially harbingers of firm, real policy to come from governments around the world? Who wants to take that first? That's a, that's a hard question. That, that, that's like a really hard one, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, at the Institute, we reviewed um, the mechanisms that make CCS projects happen. Uh, the first one was always a value on carbon or some kind of reflection of the externalities of pollution. And the second one was unlocking finance. And so from our perspective, knowing that none of the $1.8 trillion that were invested in the energy system in 2018 <coughs> went to CCS, and knowing that we actually need twice as much to deliver on Paris Climate Agreement and Sustainable Development Goals, seeing you know, this movement towards climate and taking into account the need to have low carbon capital especially is really, really important because we also know that once you have um, this, uh, this kind of risk reward allocation of environmental factors for capital flows and you're taking environmental, so delivering low carbon energy, delivering emissions reductions as a reward, we're seeing this risk perception for CCS shift. And I think as we've gathered from this pa panel, um, the, the ra rate of deployment of CCS is particularly influenced by the perception of risk. So uh, as, as such, I think you know, these, the, from, from, the, from um, the financiers, this is a really, really important part. And then obviously anything we can get to raise the profile of carbon capture is really important. And so Stripe and Microsoft announcements were really, really important, particularly because they recognize uh, the, the need to draw down emissions historically, while also um, the need for point source capture. Does that answer your question? It absolutely does. Maybe we should just stop there. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, I mean, investors are looking for some certainty, right? So, yep. so they're reluctant to, to invest in new technologies, and they want to have um, examples of how that technology has worked. You know, we have the new, we have NetPower, we have Petronova, and they're both new technologies, and, and it would be so amazing to see those really um, the not proliferated. NetPower and Petronova, these are the projects down in Texas, Texas is right. that right? One's on gas and one's on coal. And they're, they're super cool, they're um, lower costs, they deliver um, a, a lot of environmental benefits, not just carbon. And, and if you think about it, you know, those are two, but we need more. And so to go to the bank and say, hey, we need to have funding, we need to have you invest in this. I mean, that's why you know having the U.S. government take a position on pipelines and having them else also help with more deployment and deplo deployment of more pilots, and at scale pilots, that will also be very helpful to getting the investment community more comfortable with this technology. It took a while for offshore wind, for example, to get into that place as well, and they are because we have those examples. And with CCS, the more we see, the more we do, the lower the cost and the better the financing will be. Do you think we'll see institutional investors get into CCS in the same way we've seen a big movement from institutional investment very recently into offshore wind as it's matured past a, past a certain point? Or is there something intrinsically a bit different about this uh, technology set? That I I, I, they're there to make money. That's what their goal is. So if this technology, can, the cost can be reduced, it can deliver value, and environmental um, amenities are increasingly valued by companies. You look across the board, and, and many companies, we have, a, um, we have 35 companies, and they're really big companies in our business council, and all of them you know, are doing different things to really make a difference towards climate. Many of them have net zero goals, many of them have internal pricing, a lot of them are out there supporting carbon pricing. Um, but, but the point here is that, you know, getting the financial community to, to buy into carbon capture 
I think it needs to be more broadly understood that that's part of a clean energy future. And Maya's talking about getting California that to be part of the answer and part of the solution. And when you talk about clean energy standards, it needs to be part of that. Um, every carbon pricing bill, I think there's nine carbon pricing bills that have been put out in the 116th Congress, four of which are bipartisan, and every single one, I think except for maybe one, um, has a mention of carbon capture in there some way, shape, or form. So, and that's, a, that's an, a huge improvement, and that's about making this a value proposition, even for the financial community. Absolutely. Um, I saw a couple <laughs> hands, uh, quite a few hands, actually, so why don't we do some yes, questions. Uh, Gentlemen, right here. We'll start there. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Janet, you made a comment about learning by doing, and my question for the panel was, how much information sharing is taking place between existing projects and new ones under development to transfer some of those lessons? And is it feasible at all for projects under development to coordinate things like equipment purchases? Because that's what large companies do to, to drive down costs. So is that something that could help with multiple project uh, deployments? Terrific. Thank you very much. Uh, another show of hands. Um, uh, we have uh, the lady over here. We'll take third, uh, mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll go to the gentleman just because the microphone's right here. Thank you. Uh, back in the dawn of uh, time, I guess, for CCS on Power 2009, the Mountaineer Project, I think it was in mm -hmm. West Virginia, the, one of the big issues was parasitic load, you know, 25, 30 percent of electricity usage just for the CCS yeah. plant as well. I think you see the number bandied around for DAC of around 25% of electricity usage to uh, you know, go towards DAC. What sort of, um, uh, what sort of, sort of innovation have you seen on the electricity uh, front now with, with carbon capture technologies given that you know, solar and wind have plummeted, you've got starting to see battery storage competitive paired with that. Are you starting to see that uh, move in consort with carbon capture technologies as well to sort of get over the kind of high electricity usage problem question. Great, thank you. And then a question uh, right here. Perfect. In terms of a country by country breakdown of co contributions to global co carbon emissions, I'm curious about the countries at the bottom of that list that aren't major carbon emitters, are producing too much or contributing to that uh, level that we're producing at the moment. There, do you see more of a top down approach from the government trying to take, um, trying to still focus on it to develop um, more technology that could be better in the CCS field? Or do you see it not being on their radar at all? Or do you see it being a private sector, them taking the onus to maybe try to come up with more solutions? Is it top down or is it bottom up? in those countries that aren't major carbon emitters? Great. So three terrific questions. Who wants to take one of those first? Can I just jump Jenna. in on the parasitic load question? Um, yes. It's come down. Net Power talks about um, their parasitic load being next to nothing. So, I mean, it's we learn by doing and we get better, and that's a big issue. Well, the global developments, I think a very interesting example is Norway, um, which ha has... I would guess from a total base, not that many emissions, and doesn't necessarily need carbon capture and storage to achieve climate goals. However, the Norwegian government supports CCS solely from the perspective that it's needed to reduce emissions from a global perspective or global emissions. And I think so that's a very interesting leadership um, development because what we need is governments taking on leadership to commercialize. CCS, just as governments like Germany, government like Germany and the UK have taken on leadership roles to commercialize solar and offshore wind. Excellent. Thank you. Any final comments? I, I guess I can answer the, the load planning question. And, and I think this is one of, one of the things that I think about a lot is, you know, we've kind of siloed emissions reductions and then the power sector and how we're going to supply energy and how we're also going to reduce emissions. And I think it's so important to think about these things as a whole, because if there are ways, for example, um, that we can use excess solar power to power some of these facilities, I think that's an innovative way to approach this. But we really have to start thinking about, and I sit in a state where we're in the implementation phase, and we have to start thinking about this as a whole. How can we help one project over here uh, where there might be uh, n supply, for example? Um, so I encourage you all, as you're thinking about policies, to, th to think about how these things can work together, uh, because carbon emissions reductions and the energy sector can, can work together to create more better solutions. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, 
Maya, Ryan, Janet Lee, you've been a terrific panel. Um, I hope you'll stick around uh, to also engage with the crowd. I'm sure there are many more questions. But before we wrap today, uh, for a few closing remarks, uh, I want to welcome up the director of the Global Energy Center, Randy Bell. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm what's. Thank you. Um, I am what's standing between you and a glass of wine and uh, what we hope are the results from Iowa. Uh, I checked right before I got up on stage, nothing yet. Uh, the, but uh, I heard some rumors earlier that, that Pete won, but who knows. Uh, I, my, my job really is just to thank everyone for, uh, for showing up. So um, uh, first, thank you all in the audience for coming to what I think was the hottest event in Washington, D.C. this week. Um, we are hosting another event uh, on Friday with uh, Secretary of Energy Dan Briette, who will talk about his international energy priorities. Um, one of the technologies that he is going to be talking about uh, is nuclear power, so another piece of what we see as this puzzle uh, for, uh, for meeting, uh, meeting our uh, climate, uh, climate goals. Um, really want to thank uh, everybody from uh, the Global CC, uh, CCS Institute, uh, Lee Beck, Patricia Loria, and Jeff Erickson, uh, and we just really appreciate uh, the work that we uh, are able to do with you throughout the year, and, and particularly it's great to work with Lee all the time. Um, really want to thank uh, Senator Whitehouse, who's no longer here, but I hope his staff watches this video um, and sees us thanking him. Um, he's also a great partner uh, and has done, as he mentioned, work on nuclear power and a number of other issues uh, uh, with us, so a uh, really great partner uh, for him, uh, for, for us. Um, the panelists, thank you all so much. Uh, we really, really enjoy work working with all of you and hope to do more. Um, and then the Atlanta Council staff who helped put this together. Um, David Livingston, who drives our climate and advanced energy work. Zach Strauss, who gave me the microphone and disappeared. There he is in the back. Um, we've got uh, Mitali, uh, uh, Merle, and John Suan uh, from the Global Energy Center team. Uh, Hannah uh, Dawiki, and then the uh, Atlanta Council events team, the comms team, and the AV team. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, everyone here, uh, please grab a glass of wine. If there are announcements from Iowa, we will get the microphones and tell everyone. Oh, it's on the TV out there, actually. They're apologizing for the chaos. Uh, <laughs> Um, so please stick around um, and follow the uh, Global Energy Center throughout the year uh, as we do more work like this. So thank you so much.